These are not shared values. And I'm glad that Democrats increasingly slowly are starting to speak up. Let's see if the rest of them do. Mehdi Hassan, we thank you so much for being with us. Journalist and author, host of shows on MSNBC and Peacock. His new book is Win Every Argument, The Art of Debating, Persuading, and Public Speaking. That does it for our show. I'm Amy Goodman in New York with Juan Gonzalez in Chicago. Thanks so much for joining us. The viewpoints expressed in this program are the opinions of the people expressing them and are not necessarily those of Fresh Air Incorporated, its staff, or its board of directors. I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to The Conversation with Al McFarland. I'm glad to be here and glad to have you along today. Tuesday special for us because not only do we stream live across the variety of social media platforms, but we're here live on KFAI. Uh, KFAI is truly a jewel of the community. You just heard uh, Amy Goodman's show, always informative, always dynamic, always progressive. This is a, a thinking person's radio. Well, today's show carries that tradition forward uh, in the form of the conversation with Al McFarland. Before I bring my guest on, I wanna remind you that if you're tuning into us right now through any of the social media platforms, we want you to help grow uh, this project, this process, this engagement, this community. Right now, we are streaming, as well as being live on radio on KFAI, we're streaming live to YouTube for the Black Press of America. We're streaming live to Insights YouTube page. We're streaming live to Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. And if you're on any of those platforms, if you're listening on the radio, jump on your computer or your phone and cruise over to the Insight News YouTube channel. And there, subscribe, like, and share subscribe, like, and share. We want to build community. We want to create a way for us to stay connected, to keep you notified when we're going live. We do this every day, five days a week. And I tell you, we have fun. We have great people. Uh, let me know if you're on social media. I see David Rabb has checked in. Good afternoon, David. Uh, let me know where you are. And I want to shout you out. Thank you for watching or listening and being part of the program. Well, today <clears throat> I have the great honor of uh, talking with a, a new friend that I just met, but somebody that I know I'm going to love having a relationship with, and that's Sarah M. Lomax. She's the president and CEO of WURD Radio, Pennsylvania's only African-American-owned talk radio station. Now, she's credited with transforming WURD Radio from a legacy talk radio station to a multimedia communications company providing cutting edge, original programming on air, online, and through community events. In 2017, she led the expansion of 900 AM WURD to the FM dial, now simulcasting both at 900 AM and 96.1 FM. In 2018, she spearheaded the launch of an environmental justice journalism platform called Echo Word. Maybe it's EcoWord, she'll tell me, EcoWord.com. And in 2019, she launched a new initiative called Livelihood, focused on jobs, career readiness, entrepreneurship to address the persistent wealth gap in the Black community. And most recently, she's co-founded a new media company called URL Media. It's a network of Black and Brown-owned media organizations that share content, distribution, and revenues to increase their long-term sustainability. So prior to her work with WURD Radio and URL, uh, in 1992, she co-founded HealthQuest, Total Wellness for Body, Mind, and Spirit. It was a trailblazing African-American consumer health magazine that grew from a quarterly publication to a bi-monthly with a national circulation of over half a million. She's a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania and the Columbia University Graduate School 
of journalism. She's written for the Miami Herald, the Philadelphia Inquirer, the Atlantic Journal Constitution. She's written for Essence Magazine and Modern Maturity. In 2016, she contributed to a book of essays called Our Black Sons Matter, written by Black Mothers of Sons. And in 2018, Sarah presented uh, before the Knight Commission on Trust, Media, and Democracy, uh, writing an article uh, about the topic, about that topic. So last June, she was sought out and featured on multiple BBC news programs offering commentary about the protests throughout the country and the world. She is a coach in the major Metro newspaper uh, table stakes program, and she's the program lead for the new BIPOC Sustainability Accelerator funded by Facebook designed to empower black and brown owned media organizations. She served as a adjunct professor, uh, professor of communications at Oglethorpe University in Atlanta. She's taught in a collaborative course at the University of Pennsylvania with Dr. John Jackson called uh, Urban Ethnography, which taught students how to create audio documentaries that aired on WURD radio. She's completed the Harvard Business School's executive leadership program. It's called the Business of Entertainment, Media, and Sports. That in two 2018, 2019, she completed her Media Transformation Challenge, formerly the Schultzberger Program at the Harvard Kennedy School. Most recently, she completed the JSK Community Impact Fellowship at Stanford. She's obviously received numerous awards, including the Beacon of Light Award from the Congressional Black Caucus for Health Quest, uh, uh, HealthQuest Magazine's Outstanding Health Coverage. She received the Woman of Substance Award from the National Medical Association. She was recognized as one of the 100 people to watch by Business Philadelphia Magazine and selected for Women of Distinction Award given by the Philadelphia Business Journal. Uh, I'm gonna take a breath and say, <laughs> right right now, what a stellar, stellar, stellar career. There's more, there's more, there's more, but I don't wanna keep doing this. Uh, Sarah, I wanna bring you in, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the conversation. Wow, what a story. What a phenomenal. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. Um, yeah, it's, that's kind of like the full, <laughs> that's not my abbreviated uh, bio. You, you were reading the whole thing, the well, whole enchilada. <laughs> and it's it's absolutely fascinating. Uh, you know, I enjoyed reading it <clears throat> because each line I read reminded me of things that are so critical in our community timely in the world and that are important to me personally as an editor, as a journalist, uh, as a reporter, and as an entrepreneur. So I'm looking forward to this conversation, uh, just hearing your story and in part, uh, with your permission, sharing mine with you because I think we've got some parallel experiences and perhaps uh, parallel, maybe even competing observations. But I think that's the joy of being in our profession as journalists, that we get a chance to pursue uh, and challenge and seek uh, clarity by conversation, by discussion, and uh, by examination. So welcome, welcome, welcome. So give me the mission for WURD. What's your, your primary mission for that organization as it exists today? Sure, sure. Well, thank you again for, um, for inviting me on and having me, um, giving me an opportunity to tell my story and the story of the work that I'm doing. Um, so WURD is a black talk radio station in Philadelphia. My family owns the station. This is actually our 20th anniversary in, 2000, in 2023. Um, my father purchased WURD in 2003, and um, we have been building and growing and expanding the station ever since. And Philadelphia, for your audience that may not know, is one of the blackest cities in the country. Um, we black people are the majority um, racial group in Philadelphia. We are 40, about 44% of the Philadelphia overall population. And so, you know, and, and historically, Philadelphia is the birthplace of the country. You know, a lot of people know about um, 1776, but Philly has always had a very proud and strong um, African-American presence from you know dating back to the the founding of the country and it was at one point a destination for um enslaved africans to you know migrate and make their way to freedom and so you know and philly has this long history of um of advocacy and activism for black people and so 
um, WURD's mission, I'll get to the, the question. Um, the mission is really to be a venue, a space where Black Philadelphians can speak and be heard in their own voice. We can talk about our, our um, successes, our challenges, our Black excellence, our, you know, the diversity of who we are as people, the full complexity of our humanity, as opposed to being um, represented so often in mainstream media as one tiny, often negative thing. And so we, um, we see ourselves as a place, we are a two-way talk radio station. So we are in conversation with our community all day, every day. And we've expanded to be very multimedia, multi-platform. So we have the, as you mentioned, AM and FM radio um, signal, but we also um, have what we call Word TV, which is um, where we stream on Facebook Live and on our website. We have three websites, wordradio.com, ecoword.com, which you mentioned is our environmental justice uh, initiative, and um, wordworks.com, which is our jobs and economy and wealth creation website um, that's part of our program called Livelihood. And we do a lot of community events. So we are all about reaching the community, educating, informing, and engaging with our community so that we can um, you know, bridge the information gap that too often exists in big cities, especially a city like Philadelphia, where there's tons of resources, but for whatever reason, they don't tend to get to the people who need them the most, which are um, often Black folks. So we are that, that, um, that bridge and that gap filler. So uh, when your dad started or bought the uh, station, uh, what was his vision? What do you think uh, he had in mind? What motivated him to buy it? What were his goals and what were his expectations? And now that you've uh, 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 sort of assumed the leadership, uh, what has been the change? If any. Oh, boy. So my father was a physician um, by training, and um, he had uh he was also a, a very very entrepreneurial he was i would say a renaissance man um and he was a he had a uh he became very successful in healthcare management and so he uh got a contract from the state of pennsylvania that became very lucrative to manage to do managed care for um west philadelphia um residents which is a predominantly black community and he, he had a lot of success with that, expanded, expanded, and ended up um, uh, being acquired. The company ended up being acquired by United Healthcare. And so that created what I call a wealth event. And mm -hmm. so but my dad was always a race man. He, um, he really believed in empowering Black people. And before he had his wealth event, he was caring for because his his career, he was a practicing physician for 32 years. And um, but he he always owned the properties where he had medical centers. He was very he was a very entrepreneurial physician. So anyway, he bought um, word at the behest of a radio legend in Philadelphia named Cody Anderson. Cody Anderson had um, run stations. He had owned stations in Philadelphia and um, he came to my father around, really it was around 2001, 2002, to say that um, the, the um, flagship black talk radio station in Philadelphia at the time was called WHAT. It was going out of business. And Philly has this long history of uh, black talk radio, a very long history. And Philly was about to be without a, a black talk station. And so Cody Anderson went to my father and said, Doc, look, there's this station, WURD, that's for sale. You know, a lot of people know about your success. A lot of people are going to come to you and ask you for money for lots of different things. You can't give everyone money, but you can give them a voice through this radio station. And, you know, my dad was a real soft touch. And that <laughs> that really resonated with him. Um, and 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 so he did. He he had the, the resources. Um and he bought the station. And at the time, it was it, it was a very different business model than it is now. It was mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I won't go into what the business model was, but it it was actually a very um, the and my dad went into because he again, he was not a media person. 
he went into buying WURD and he said, you know, I don't have to make money on this. I don't have to make a lot of money on this business enterprise. I'm doing this as a community service, but I don't want to lose money. And right. so from about 2000, and you know where I'm going with this, Al, yep. from about 2003, when the sale was completed, really, I mean, real talk until about 20, I would say 2014, 15, the station lost money mm -hmm. um, every month. And, you know, it was actually bleeding money for the first, like, uh, I would say seven or eight years of its existence. And so I'm one of six children. Um, all of my siblings worked in the family business in healthcare. Mm -hmm. I was the only journalist, um, which is why I started Health Quest magazine. I started a health magazine because I wanted to stay true to my journalistic roots, but I wanted to also be, you know, um, industry adjacent to my family's business. And, you know, the, the magazine, I ran that and grew it for 10 years. Um, I ended up closing that in 2002 after September 11th hit, happened. And as you know, the bottom dropped out of the advertising yep. industry. It dropped out of everything, really. The bottom just fell out of American society in a way. And so I ended up closing the magazine down. And, and around that same time, my dad was buying WURD and I was invited to do a radio show. And I was very clear I did not want to be involved at all in the management of the radio station. I was still kind of licking my wounds from having to close my magazine. It, it was very painful, as you can imagine, you know, as an entrepreneur, when you put everything you have into something and it doesn't. And, and I have the kind of constitution that if I think. I can make something work. I'm going to just like keep at it, keep at it until you know I just believe it's going to turn around. And I really did. And eventually I had to come to the to the realization that I was not going to be able to make my magazine successful. And so I closed that down, started doing the show on WURD with the understanding that that was the extent of my involvement at the radio station. Um, the station floundered. It struggled mightily. It um, was losing money, a lot of money every month. It went through many leadership changes. Um, and I started feeling like I started feeling complicit in its demise by my lack of participation in the business. I was the only one in my family that had media experience. I had, I didn't know radio, but I knew how to run a media business. I knew about mm -hmm. advertising. I knew about product development. I knew about distribution and marketing and multi-platform. And so I started feeling um, like it was like family malpractice to be, be willfully sitting on the sidelines when this business was just floundering and struggling and sputtering. And it was a very public business because everybody knew my family owned it. And so it, it just it just didn't feel like it was a good look and it wasn't right for me to just willfully sit so by the sideline. And so in, in 2009, I dipped my toe in by doing a, a big event that was the one year anniversary of Barack Obama's one year uh, election. Right. And it was really successful. Tell me if we need to take a break because I know how radio rolls. And so no, 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 no. I'll, I'll jump in and, and let me know. Okay. remind people who we are. But this story is fascinating and you're hitting every string of my heart with every word that you say. And uh, uh, my, my daughter runs my company. That's, oh, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm tracking you okay. in a major way right now. So go ahead and tell the story. Yeah, I'm looking so... at my future and listening <laughs> to you. Yeah, so, so I was... Um... I, so so basically 2009 we do this big event I just say you know let me just see you know how it would how what I could do with this with this um, enterprise and so my family was like whoa that was incredible and so they asked me to write a um, you know a strategic plan and to write the business plan and so little by little so I write the strategic plan you know I have this this vision for it being you know this multimedia kind of powerhouse that really is, super serving the black community um, in Philadelphia. And so um, they loved it. 
by 2010, I was installed, I would say, as the um, president and um, general manager. And that was probably the hardest thing I had ever done. So I had, I have three sons. Mm -hmm. Um, my older, my, my oldest two were, were, were older. And I said, I was not going to go back to, and I worked the entire time when they were very little, I was doing my magazine. I was traveling. I was like, ah, (laughs) and I said, I wasn't going to do that with my third child who, um, was born after I closed, um, the magazine. And I said, I was going to just like try and be home and be present. Although I was, I'm not a stay at home mom. (laughs) I'm just (laughs) not wired that way. Um, I was still doing all kinds of stuff. So like in between closing the magazine and starting to work at WURD, I um, became a yoga teacher and I went and did a holistic nutrition program. And so I started doing yoga and nutrition workshops for black women in between Word and HealthQuest. Anyway, so that's why I'm saying I'm not a stay at home mom. (laughs) I just was like, I had to do something. So anyway, um, I start at the radio station and boy, it has been a real journey from 2010, which is when I, when I jumped in a hundred percent to now, which is 13 years later. And I have, um, you know, what I inherited quite frankly was um, an organization that had very low Mm. self-esteem uh, that was that did not believe that we could be anything more than like a low power AM radio station. And so and I'll tell you, having started a, a, a company like a startup, which which is URL media and inheriting a low performing media organization, that's like a turnaround. Mm-hmm. It is very, very hard. It is very hard, way harder to inherit something that you have to turn as opposed to starting from something from right. scratch. That's, that's my experience. Okay. Um, because Let me tell people, this is, um, yes. I'm Al McFarland. You're listening to the conversation with Al McFarland, my guest, Sarah M. Lomax, Lomax. He's president and CEO of Word Radio in Pennsylvania and uh, doing so much more. Let's continue the conversation. Uh, go ahead, Sarah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just, it's, it's, um, so, you know, I've had to, you know, like, like, because when you inherit something that is losing a lot of money, it's almost like, you know, you break it, you buy it. Even Mm -hmm. though I didn't break it, I was now a hundred percent responsible for Mm -hmm. fixing it. And, you know, my family was really, when I inherited it, when I took over, my family was really at a point of ready to pull the plug because it had been losing money for so long. And so I was like, let me just, just give me, just give me a minute. Let me, let me see if there's, you know, if I can, if I can um, make some changes and see if we can start to turn it. And, um, and so it's, it's taken a while, but we, we have become profitable over the last Mm -hmm. several years. Um, We have expanded, a lot, you know, and, and I have an amazing team. Um, You know, so it's, it's, um, I've learned a lot. And I have to say, the reason I wanted to mention the yoga, and the nutrition, and meditation as like that interim, all everything that I did up to the time that I started with word prepared me for the work that I'm doing now. And so I firmly believe that my yoga practice and my meditation practice and what I know about nutrition um, and mind, body, spirit connectivity has allowed me to be successful in this work. Um, Because I don't know if, if this has been your experience, but what I know, because there were many, my father passed away in 2013. Mm. And before that, so between 2010 and 2013, you know, he was kind of the backstop, you know, if, if there was like a shortfall or if there was like a, you know, like like there was a gap in, in payroll, he was there to cover it. But when he passed away in 2013, it was like, yo, and, and as you, I know you know this, like what's happening now pro, post mm-hmm. George Floyd, post 2020 protests where 
you know, people want to give more money and more shine to black media and black businesses or at maybe. Least they did in 2021, maybe. right? Maybe a little bit more. Okay. Okay. All I know is like pre 2020, there was nobody was giving you lines of credit. Nobody right. was giving you right. loans. Nope. Nobody was giving you any love or looks. N and so, nor the time of day. Nor the t not the time of day. Not mm -hmm. the, and I have to, I have to reiterate that over and over and over again to young media entrepreneurs of color who are just getting in the game now. Cause I'm like, yo, it's different. It's, it might not be where it should be, but it's definitely different from when, from pre 2020. Cause mm -hmm. that, I mean, and so I had many sleepless nights, many sleepless nights when I did not know how I was going to make payroll. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people, and this is, this is, I'm speaking to your daughter now, a lot of people, first of all, they um, underestimated my ability because I was the owner's daughter. Mm -hmm. When I took control, mm -hmm. they assumed that I only had the job. And really, I probably did. I only had that job because I was the owner's daughter. Mm -hmm. But what they didn't know is that I actually knew my stuff. and mm -hmm. I actually had skills and abilities to do the work. And I was committed and I was determined. And, you know, someone said to me, a lot of people think that you were given this but mm -hmm. you have created it based on merit. And it's mm -hmm. true. It's very true. And, um, you know, I, and, and believe me, I totally underestimate, I mean, I, I do not um, take for granted that I've had a lot of opportunity and privilege mm -hmm. because of, you know, what my father has, was able to, to uh, accomplish and what I was able to step into. But, to take the station from where it was to where it is now was not um, was not based just on his um, legacy. It's been a lot of work and mm -hmm. and effort, and so um, so yeah. So hey, now let, let, let me jump in. Have you so yeah. where did you did you work outside of the family business uh, outside of your own business? Did you have well, I listed some of your, your employment, right? Uh, talk about yeah, no, that so, experience of working and working both in black organizations, if you were, and in white organizations. What's the difference between working and being the owner of the enterprise? Yeah, well, I'll tell you, my career has been almost 100% um, working within my family business and as an entrepreneur. You know, the, mm -hmm. the things that are, are in my bio were mostly freelance. Like I wrote for Essence. I wrote for, right. Um, right. you know, these different publications, but that was really in addition to the other work that, that mm -hmm. I was doing. Um, and I say this, it used to be not a point of pride <laughs> because honestly, like if you only had experience, work experience in black media for many, many years, it was seen as a deficiency. Mm -hmm. Um, if you've only worked for a family business, it was seen as a deficiency. So what white organizations have done is point to, oh, she went to University of Pennsylvania. Oh, she went to Columbia Graduate School of Journalism to validate me because yeah. I didn't work at the New York Times. I didn't work at, you know, the Wall Street Journal. I didn't have that pedigree. And so they got to go back to my to my academic, um, you know, history to to validate me. But now I really see it as a point of strength. Mm -hmm. And um, and pride that my entire career has been about building, sustaining and, you know, amplifying black voices and black people and celebrating our our um, our exceptionalism, you know, talking about our challenges, all of those things and and really figuring out the very, very difficult and complicated um process of creating a profitable business while honest being an honest broker for black people being a place where black people feel like they are authentically reflected and represented that is not an easy balancing act mm -hmm. that is not an easy balancing act to really center 
black people and black issues and 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 serious black pe black issues not just entertainment um but 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 the complicated and hard to talk about hard to look at issues around race and racism in this country and invite advertisers and create a space where corporate America feels like they can support you. And a lot of them don't, quite frankly. A lot of but them don't. A lot of them, enough of them can, do that we're, of them we're still here. But they, they do. My experience has been uh, corporations will do right when they have to, uh, not because it's right to do. And so Absolutely. as often as not, the strategy has been, how do we put them in a position where the, the, where the decision they have to make is a decision that benefits us? And we know that, that will, it will benefit them as well, but they are just so focused on excluding us and, and pushing against us that they will even deny their own benefit and growth and their own humanity because they feel mission one is to um, protect the... Uh, the citadel from the uh, the invaders or the barbarians. And guess what? We get to be the barbarians at the gate in their point of view from their mind. So they're always uh, in a, a structure and a pros in a posture of, um, of uh, being intentional and, uh, and on automatic in the marginalization of our people and of our progress. And they give when they have to and when they must and when uh, they can't uh, uh, publicly uh, reveal, um, what's the right word for it? Uh, you know, their, their, their hidden innermost agenda and that's the maintenance of power and it's certainly yeah. not sharing power. But our job has to be to demand that yeah. we have our seat at the table or we create our own tables that reflect and uh, project our own interest and that we negotiate, as you say, we're honest brokers for the interest of our people at the uh, table of decision in the realm of power. Uh, this is a great conversation. Absolutely. I'm Al McFarland. This is the conversation with Al McFarland, my guest, Sarah M. Lomax, the president and CEO of WURD Radio in Pennsylvania and so much more. And Sarah, as uh, you were speaking, so was your dad ever was, was Dr. Lomax, right? Was yeah. he actively involved in the radio station or simply the owner that managed people? He was, I mean, my dad was a very hands-on person um, and he was a very prominent person. So, mm. and, and he was very approachable. So mm. all of those okay. things can, you know, can, can converge in, in interesting ways. Um, he was um, an avid listener to the station um, I think that, um, by the time I took over, what was, what was difficult when I first took over was that, um, a lot of people, I was trying to put in new policies and processes and, and, and things like that. And people would go around me and go to him. And, you know, he was famous for giving everyone an ear. And so it was very, very difficult in the early days of my management because um, people knew that that they could get to him. And at the beginning, he, you know, I would I would make certain policies. People would go to him, and he would basically reverse my what I what I had planned, and that was hard. So how that did you guys navigate difficult. that? You and your father, as a fa father daughter family owned business, uh, you in a sense having to emerge. Uh, and to be uh, a person speaking with authority and substance at the same time respecting him and his investment, right? His ownership of the company, but in his wanting, I'm sure, to create a space for you and the family, I'm sure his mission had to include the idea of generational wealth, of how do all of my uh, family and generations prosper? How did you negotiate your conflict with him? I'm asking as a dad who's got a daughter, <laughs> so this, yeah. is, uh, this is personal for me. Yeah, it's a it's a very good question. Um, and it it I would just say the short answer is it depended. It depended on what it was. Some things I just capitulated and I was like, whatever. Um, other things I like, you know, went to the mat 
I mm-hmm. like, I like, um, and, and even when I went to the mat, I might've lost, but um, I'll tell you, there was a situation where I was going to um, assume the helm at one point. And mm-hmm. before I had like gotten all the way in, my dad like made a decision that overruled me. Mm-hmm. And I said, never mind, I'm not going to do it. Mm-hmm. And so that was a situation where I was like, whoa, I can't, I can't, I can't operate like this. Mm-hmm. But then, you know, I came back, it came back around of maybe a year or two later. Mm-hmm. And um, I, you know, I, I, he, I think he was, was recognized that he needed the mm-hmm. kind of leadership that I was able to provide. So I think sure. he was humbled <laughs> by mm-hmm. kind of the repeated, um, you know, challenges that the station was having. And I think by the time I took over and, you know, he was starting to be like, yo, you know, I think you might actually, and, and we started having wins. He started seeing like success and some, yep. some things turning around and he was like, Oh, okay. Maybe, maybe she does know what she's doing. And then by the, towards the very end of his life, he was just like, yo, talk to Sarah, you know, don't, 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 don't try and, and, and come uh, to me. And what's wonderful is I still work with all of my siblings. Um, They're all involved in various ways in um, kind of on the periphery, but, but still involved in the station. Are you the youngest or oldest or in the middle? Where are you? I'm the second to youngest. Okay. Um, And my, my oldest brother is our CFO. Um, my second brother is um, a real estate developer who is developing a new property where Word is going to be. Our new offices will be. My sister right above me just passed in May, but she was our general counsel and, and our mm-hmm. HR director. She was amazing. Um, mm-hmm. And then my, my youngest brother is the chair of the Lomax Companies, which is the umbrella organization mm-hmm. for uh, Word. And he's like our business development. Like anytime we do a big deal, like get an investor or thinking about acquiring something, he does all the due diligence and makes sure that the legal and the business stuff is straight. So, and, and the thing that I was going to say is that my siblings, we're in lockstep. They're like, yo, word is Sarah's, let her do her thing. And as long as she's not, you know, as long as she's making money, (laughs) we're good. (laughs) So So. I'm imagining, I'm visualizing this uh, powerhouse uh, juggernaut of a family that you have and that you are, this organization that you are. And it sounds like you're saying that uh, each person has a portfolio or a point and that you sort of um, have created a process that really respects and nurtures the thinking, the interest, the curiosity of each member. And so that your your first response when a person says something is not, oh, no, that's not going to work. It's probably, mm, check it out, you know, and that that person can depend on all of you to bring your best ideas or criticism or evaluation, assessment and energy uh, to prove or disprove that idea. But it works yeah. that way. Is that fair or not? Well, I would say now it is. Um, mm-hmm. it wasn't, I mean, when the station was really struggling, I, I have to be honest, you know, like, like people really, including my family members, um, they were not believers. <laughs> my mm-hmm. mother, I will say, who is still with us mm-hmm. has always been the champion for work. Okay. She is always, you know, even in our darkest days, she was the one who was like this is a gem. This we need to support this no matter what. I mean, mm-hmm. she has been steadfast mm-hmm. through through the hard times and through the now better times, the 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 more flush times. But I will say that but for my mother and my father and my like commitment, I think that there people were like ye of little faith. People did not think that word had the capacity to actually mm-hmm. turn around. And what's so fascinating, Al, now is that word has become in my family's portfolio. You know, we're not the most profitable. We're not like wildly successful, mm-hmm. but it has become this gem because mm-hmm. it is so well respected in Philadelphia. 
which again is, you know, the, the leadership is predominantly black and city council and mm -hmm. the police commissioner, like, and, and the leader, the, the stakeholders in Philadelphia know the value of word. And that has created value for the other business enterprises that my family's business are involved in. So it's, it's been fascinating to see that shift, that turn from being kind of like the, you know, the junkyard dog, quite frankly, that's like, you know, yeah, 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 we'll, we'll tolerate you to actually being a serious contributor to this, um, this portfolio and the work that we're doing is, it, it really is a, um, a powerful a asset, mm -hmm. like in, in all, in all like uh, versions of that word. And it sounds like you're, you have continued to evolve and emerge as a beacon, uh, as a pathfinder for our community in particular, but in doing so, you're really showing a path forward for the entire community, for the entire city of uh, Philadelphia and for actually our country, because you're uh, illuminating the talent, the gifts uh, of those that have been marginalized uh, and, uh, and denied. And you uh, represent uh, the truth of our people's genius, our gifts and our capacity to serve ourselves and in doing so serve community, serve humanity. I've got a, a great friend, a uh, person that I admire a lot. I'm sure you know him, uh, Bob Bogle. Uh, yes, at the Philadelphia Tribune. So he's been like, uh, you know, when I started and joined the National Newspaper Publishers Association, he'd always been a fixture and emerged over the years to be uh, uh, holding all of the uh, officer spots and even being chairman of the organization. But he was mm -hmm. a, a marvelous person to watch because he was a great salesman, a great organizer, a great orator. And he's been on this program a couple of times and always, always enjoy him. How do you work with other uh, media and where do you see as you are uh, developing uh, this vision and the voice, the word concept, the word mission, uh, describe more how the marketplace is changing. I love the fact that you told me to begin with that your city is what, 44% African-American or black? And, black, yeah. you know, uh, here in Minnesota, when I started, Sarah, uh, the black population was maybe about 4%. And wow. when I would go to a corporation asking for advertising uh, in my new community newspaper that served, say, North Minneapolis, which is where I am right now. I'm operating from my home. But the table I'm sitting at now is the table I started my newspaper mm -hmm. at uh, in 1974. Right. Wow. And, uh, Congratulations. And so, uh, but I go to advertisers and say, you know, I, I'm, you know I'm, I'm a young fire brand journalist and I'm going to turn the world inside out, upside down. I'm pursuing the truth for our people. And they listen and say, uh, well, you know, uh, we gave in church on Sunday. Get out of here. Mm -hmm. So they looked at our business, not as business, but as charity. Right didn't take us seriously. And I say today, still would like to not take us seriously, but I think we determine that dialogue and how it's going to go by the courage we bring to every encounter, every conversation, and by the expectations we place and the results we seek. Uh, what was your experience in terms of the environment for, for your radio media from then to now? And where do you see us, you, going? Sure. Well, I, I just want to, again, say, um, you know, I, I want to just take my hat off to you to start a, a publication in 1974, you said, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, that's that's amazing that you are still in building and growing and, and expanding your voice and mm -hmm. serving your community. So I just really admire um, your work. Um, you know, as I said earlier, you know, there to me there is a huge kind of um, shift that that happened. That's like there's there's like a, there's pre twenty twenty and there's like post twenty twenty, mm -hmm. and I I'm not saying that post twenty twenty is 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 
perfect at all or great even. Um, but my experience, and I've said this um, to, to a lot of people that when you don't respect, value, um, see a community as fully human or, or valuable, you are not going to respect a media organization that serves that community. Right. And so if you um, think that black people are criminals and, you know, whatever all of the negative stereotypes that, that have been portrayed about us for centuries in mainstream media, if that is your understanding of black people, you are not going to value a WURD or you know, an insight magazine or, you know, the, 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 the work that we are committed to because you don't value that community. And so that has been my experience. But at the same time, I go back to, you know, Freedom's Journal, you know, mm -hmm. like, like, you know, we have such a rich history of Black journalists and media people who during slavery, you know, they were committed to advocating on behalf of Black people because we deserved to determine our own reality and to portray mm -hmm. our own reality and not allow other people's perceptions of us to be the way that, that, that um, the only representation. And so, you know, you go back to, I think, Freedom's Journal was published in 1827 or, or maybe it was 1849. I, I might have my dates mixed up, but it was pre the end of slavery. <laughs> Let me just mm -hmm. say that. And so, you know, I take such, um, I take such uh, comfort and, and I get so much motivation when I think about, you know, Frederick Douglass and Ida B. Wells and, you know, all the people who came before us doing this work and, doing it without any real, I mean, you know, uh, support. And so if they could do it, you know, I, I mean, it's, it's like easy peasy on, on, on this side. Um, Let so, me ask you to draw a line between uh, move, move, I think Philadelphia move mm -hmm. and George Floyd. Oof. Oh man. So the move bombing, was one of the most horrific um, incidents of kind of, I would say, state violence, police violence against civilians. Um, I'd say in the history of the country, which gets very little, very little coverage. Um, basically, there was a, a, some, I don't know how, many people describe the MOVE organization differently, but some people call it a back to nature group, but it was a group of black people mm -hmm. who were, um, had many, had several um, uh, altercations with the police over, over several, um, over multiple years. And the, the, they had been, they had been kind of a thorn in the police's side for probably, you know, 10, 15 years. And so they were in a house, they, they lived in a house and it was adults, children um, in West Philadelphia, which is a predominantly black community. And the community to be like, the story that's not told is that the community really wanted them out. The community, the black people in that community did not like having them living in their community because they had like dogs, they had, you know, they had, they were perceived to have weapons. The children were like unkempt. It was it was a they, they had a a um, a, a microphone like a, an amplification mm -hmm. system on the house, and they would blare like loud messages all hours of the night because they were they were really antagonizing to their to their neighbors. So mm -hmm. it was not like they were well loved, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. um, but. Um, the police, so so I'm I'm not sure exactly what happened. I think the neighborhood kind of went to the the city and said, look, you gotta like get these people out. And I'm not exactly sure what sparked the specific um bombing, but the the 
the police ended up dropping a bomb on top of the, the house of the move building that burned and it, and it started burning. And the police, com- I mean, the fire commissioner said, let the fire burn. Do not put the fire out. Let the fire. And so that decision ended up burning a whole city block of, mm-hmm. of innocent people. Mm-hmm. They ended up killing, mm-hmm. um, I think it was 13 people from the Move family, mm-hmm. including several children. Mm-hmm. And there's like, there are debates back and forth between whether. You know, there were people who were fleeing the move house and the police shot them or the, they were fleeing and they started shooting at them. So they retreated back into the house and ended up. But it, it's it is one of the most horrific things. And and um, it was a, there was a black mayor at the time, mm-hmm. um, Mayor Wilson Good, who ended up taking responsibility for it, even though, you know, there were questions as to whether it was his decision, but it was, it's just one of the most, um, and, you know, no one was ever, was ever held accountable for it. Um, really. Um, the only person who there were, the the only people that went to prison for that were move members. Now imagine that. Mm -hmm. So, um, so not, not hard to imagine. I mean, it's par for, par for the course. So so how do you connect that with, uh, in your mind with with, with George Floyd? Yeah, I think that um, the um, the impunity by which police are able to enact terror on black people and black Mm -hmm. lives is the is the the through line. Mm -hmm. Um, And the fact that but for the fact that that was captured on video, Mm -hmm. all those cops probably would have been, you know, exonerated or, or not charged at all. And so, you know, the, 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 the big difference is in 1985, which is when MOVE happened, that we didn't have self, you know, you know, cameras on our phone. We didn't have all that stuff. Right, right. Um, even though the media was there, the media was there, you know, you, we have lots of footage of that, that MOVE um, bombing and the fire, but you didn't have people inside the house taking videos. Mm-hmm. And and chronicling like like now you chronicle everything. Mm-hmm. So to me the the um, and the difference is that you know the the police officers were held accountable mm-hmm. in George Floyd's murder, um, but not in the move bombing. Still, nope. and not across the country. But it's not too late. I think our people are still seeking justice, and we are becoming more and more used to. Uh, uh, the idea that we can and should, and that we ultimately must uh, demand and seek justice everywhere. Because I think for the longest time, when those of us in the activist community raised our voices, there was an ambivalence. Uh, There was a a sense of passivity in the community saying, don't stir it up, you know, don't make them mad, or things that could be worse. And so uh, we had an ability to get along or go along and I think we've uh, we're beginning to shed that, and beginning to uh, be more comfortable in our authentic selves, and uh, our authenticity again demands that we respect uh, our own humanity, our own voice, our own aspirations, and our own uh, expectations that we set for ourselves and community, and therefore we set expectations for humanity. And to the degree that institutions fail or transgress uh, our humanity or humanity itself, which is our humanity, we must hold institutions accountable and uh, demand and expect and force change or force alternatives for our people and for the community. But I go on and on like this could I just say, could I say, I know we got to get ready to wrap, but can I just say you would ask me about how am I working with other media? And I just want to yeah. speak to um, yeah. my new, my new venture, URL Media, which stands for Uplift, Respect and Love. And that is born out of a necessity to work collaboratively with other black and brown media organizations to make sure that we collectively have more 
sustainability and ex um, expansion in terms of growth. And so URL is a network of black and brown owned media organizations from across the country. Mm. We started in 2021 with eight members. We now have 20 members and it's, it's black, African-American, Native American, Latino, South Asian, East Asian, immigrant. And we come together to share content, um, great, create greater awareness for each other's content and share revenues as a way to build, as I said, greater sustainability and longevity. So that's um, a very we intentional- We have an organization thing. here that I was one of the founders of called the Minnesota Multicultural Media Consortium. And uh, it, it's comprised of Black, African, Asian, Latino, Native American, uh, Hmong, uh, media owners working together, selling together, and uh, trying to create. And the principle that we operated from, uh, Sarah, was that the story I told you about being uh, dismissed summarily because we were perceived to be small and insignificant. We put ourselves and our stories and circulations together and came back to the market saying we represent uh, a million people or 500,000 as right. opposed to 40,000. And is that a number that meets your criteria? And obviously it does and it did. What it did is uh, removed one more excuse, one more layer exactly. of resistance. And that's what the work has always been. But uh, yeah, so and so, how, how is that going so far? And what can people around the country do to support you? Yeah, so it's going, it's going really, really well. Um, we've actually come out of the gate profitable after two years, we've been profitable each year. Um, we have been able to distribute almost $650,000 to our network partners across the, the nation. Um, we are, you know, just growing and growing and growing in terms of being able to support other aspects of um, the needs of our of our partner organizations, whether it's how to attract, um, you know, a high caliber talent to continue to to elevate our organizations, how to create succession planning, which I'm I'm in the midst of of doing as well. But like all the things that we struggle with as independent Black and Brown media organizations, URL is trying to step into and and speak into. Um, those issues to, to help our organization. We got to wrap it up right here, yeah. Sarah. Thank you so much. What a wonderful conversation. Let's stay in touch. I, I really uh, want to uh, have you and my daughter, Batala McFarland, have a conversation sometime. I would love uh, to. Thank you. thank you so much. I'm Al McFarland. This is The Conversation with Al McFarland. We'll see you next time. Take care. Mm -hmm.